Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children 18 plus, you are tuned in to the Lone Officer Podcast with me, Dustin Owen, and my main man, J.C. John Coleman. Dear, what's popping? Hey, Super Bowl no is over. No one cares. Thank God football's over. No one gives a shit about that sport. Well, yes, millions upon millions of people Just care about that Just in this sport. country. And others. Name the other one. Germany, for one. Foot, American football. Oh, love it. Germans love American football. In fact, there used to be NFL Europe. The Frankfurt used Rhine. To be, used to be, keyword. They still do. They still do. Have you ever seen the Jags go over to London and play? Yeah. No. Yeah, they yeah. love it. They love it. They have no know. idea what's going on. Right? And most of them were sloshed when they when, yeah. they, when, when they hopped on. Apparently the USFL is coming back or some. Sh- some. Supposedly. I see the promos for that. That looks like another terrible yeah, league. But nonetheless, it was a good weekend. Right, we football is behind us. It was a good game. I didn't care who won. I hit a couple prop bets, so that was Did fun. Did you win? I think overall, I may be down five dollars. I made six twenty-five dollar bets. Would you do like a DraftKings? Saw Kevin Hart commercial, signed the Something QR code. Something like really? that. Yeah, I have no <laughs> idea how I'm gonna get my money back out of this. I literally could care less if it was the Chiefs who won or the Eagles who won. You know, I just wanted a good game, and we got it. You know who won? The refs. The refs won. The refs always win. Roger Goodell always wins. I love it when they pander those people in the box, and it's him and just five other just odd people, and it just doesn't add up. Roger, I am the Gestapo Goodell. Sitting next to Elon Musk and then the guy that had the heart attack. God, such a promo pain in the ass. I need you sitting next to me, and then they're going to cut to us in the third quarter. Now you can leave. But there are millions upon millions, if not hundreds of millions. Wow, of hundreds of millions of Tens people. Tens of millions. Hey, of but I will love say, I will football. say this: I called on the last episode since we recorded it early. I called the fact that a team was going to win by three at the last second. It was just the wrong team. Good I did. For I was you. like, I was like, the Eagles are going to win on some bullshit at the end, probably like a field goal, and technically it did. Just the Chiefs did, but you know, because the refs. Paid hey, you're close enough. Yeah. Kind of like those alien balloons floating around the United States. They're getting close enough, God, no and then our F-22s paying, are just... No one is paying attention to it. They're literally just playing space warriors, space invaders. Well, it's because it happened in the Super Bowl, so nobody cares. Yep, so you're just... You're you're paying attention. You're watching this. I see the I see the headlines, but I'm like, I look around, and nobody else seems to care, so I just keep it moving. Yeah. Well, it was another good weekend. Not only did we get to watch football, barbecue. I said barbecue. I grilled out. Hot dogs, bratwurst. You had a party? Had family come over. Good. No, my sister-in-law came over and my cousin came over. Okay. Yep. Um, I did get to see my other sister-in-law and her awesome family. They were in town because their daughter had a gymnastics um, meet. Mm-hmm. And uh, they came over briefly on Saturday, but they came back over Sunday. I crushed breakfast. Crushed it. I'm talking eggs, bacon, sausage, Boy. biscuits, hash browns, you two cr- types of hash browns, fresh fruit. Yes, the you, whole night. You're nine. a chef. You chef it up. I love breakfast. Love breakfast, and I will cook it all day. Really? Every day. Yeah, woke up early just so that I can make breakfast. Who's a better chef in your house, you or your wife? Ooh. It was me up until about three or four years ago, and then she went hardcore into cooking real food, like food without preservatives, mm-hmm. following real recipes. She's a much better cook. Wow. Yep. And her sister, who, who was in town from Jacksonville, mm-hmm. is an even better cook. So when you get those two together and then maybe like me mm-hmm. pitching in, needs, uh, we could do some damage Needs there. more salt. Maybe yeah. add some more vinegar. And then, and then shout out to my brother-in-law, Matt. So Matt's the man. Uh, if you ever want to know anything about like commercial real estate, like that would be my go-to. He'd be my guru, uh-huh. especially like on a very corporate level, like high level, like doing commercial re- real estate transactions for companies like CSX Railroad oh, or wow. CVS Pharmacy or like you know Win Dixie Supermarkets. Well, he has a real estate license. I wouldn't call him a realtor per se. Mm. I would call him a real estate professional. But he's actually a T-Lop listener. Really? He's like, Dio, you never give me a shout out. I was like, bro, I didn't even know <laughs> that you tuned in. Yeah. So, Kanji, this is your shout out. Wow. Like, thank you. And it was awesome. It was also awesome seeing them. Mm-hmm. I wish they would have stayed for the Super Bowl because that would have been super fun. But they had to leave at noon to get back to Jacksonville so they could watch the Super Bowl. I couldn't convince their children to miss school on Monday. Today. I was like, hey, guys, just miss school. Stay at our house tonight. Watch the Super Bowl. Yeah, who cares? Get up in the morning. You can go to school late. Or don't go at all. Or not. No. They would have gone late. What grade? Mm, fifth and <laughs> seventh. Shit. What, did you re- what do you seventh. remember from fifth and seventh? Nothing. My teacher's names and who my girlfriend was. 
And you're still, that I can and, tell and you're you. still dating her to this day. I'm not. Not in elementary school, John. That didn't start till high school. <laughs> that didn't start till high school. But okay. um, you know, it's funny. I, do, I, I told Matt, I go, I actually do share stories about you all the time. Not usually using his name. Yeah, pseudonym. But like talking about like, you know, life lessons that he has learned along his business track or even in personal finance, mm-hmm. lots of successes that he and his family have, have had. And yes, I share those as like, yeah, you can too. Right. right. Like, or if this ever happens to you, it's okay. Because let me tell you a story about someone I know who overcame and now look where they are today. Mm-hmm. Um, and he didn't know that. So it was a chance for me to share that. With there you them. go. You know, what people don't know, John, what's that? I have found this coaching loan officers, especially, uh-huh. but even their clients, the end consumer. I don't think anyone really understands how real estate agents are compensated. Like how, their business world operates and how they make money. They sell a home and get a commission off of it. Okay, you know more than most, but you know exactly what that looks like. No. Let's talk about it. Okay. So let's spend today's episode, and I don't know what you want to title it, but let's title it something like how realtors are paid or mm-hmm. how much money do realtors make. Mm-hmm. Or like if I was talking to loan officers, I was like, y'all need to listen to this because you can't truly be a valuable partner Mm -hmm. to someone if you don't know how their business works. And by their business, I meant how the revenue is generated, how much of that revenue they get to keep, and then how much of that revenue ends up becoming taxable income. Mm. That's what I want to talk about. Because most of us, we work for a living. We work in order to make money so we can use that money to support our lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Some of us have a lifestyle that's grandiose. Mm. Some of us have a lifestyle that is meek and meager. Some of us are meek and meager and can afford grandiose, we choose not to. Some of us can only afford grandi- uh, mm-hmm. meek and meager, yeah, but, but we pay for grandiose. Yeah, the majority. That's not for this episode. We have done plenty of episodes on budgeting, mm-hmm. and I'm sure we will do some more coming up in the future. Yep. Or maybe we'll start doing some intentional content on our website. Oh, there you go. Yeah, a little plug for tloponline.com. Mm-hmm. Y'all should be checking out our website. It is chock full of additional content. And it's cool, we just hopped off another call with my buddy Carlos. So you know Carlos because y'all worked at E8 way back in the day together. Mm. I know Carlos because we went to high school together, but y'all may know Carlos because uh, he's one of the bros in um, the Marvel's Hawkeye. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's played a character in The Walking Walking Dead. Dead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Alvaro. He Mm -hmm. played Alvaro in The Walking Dead. He's one of the bros uh, from Marvel's Hawkeye, and he's been a plethora of other shows, commercials, but he's also a local radio um, personality. Personality, Yes, talk radio, FM talk radio personality. He's been on the air for like 20 years, but I just hopped off the phone with Carlos and his publicist. Mm. Guess who's going to be signing up to do some TLOP live events? Someone named Carlos Navarro. Someone named Carlos Navarro, yeah. So I told him how we're going to try to get up to Oklahoma City in October, he's like, yeah, love to do it. Love to do it. He's like, I can actually do that event with you. I can go see a couple clients while I'm up there working a couple other gigs. I got you. So we're going to see if we can do like three or four events with Carlos doing the motivational side. There you go. Because he has this awesome presentation that he gives called Mugshot to Marvel. Mm. It's his life story, his journey of being young, dumb, full of fun, Mm -hmm. to I'm now successful, both Hollywood, both local, I've run successful businesses, et cetera. So really cool. But back on realtors, back on the real estate community, back on loan officers, y'all got to know this so you can be better partners. Home buyers, you should want to know this because I promise you that realtor that you're afraid to call because you don't want them taking your money, you're going to learn on today's show, they don't. They don't take your money. Okay? And you're going to learn the value. And you'll learn how much they give and give up for the opportunity to serve you and the opportunity to earn some money. And then anyone who supports loan, um, uh, realtors, right? That'd be title companies, homeowners insurance, home inspectors, anyone who has realtors as clients, whether it's a CPA, financial advisor, y'all need to know this too. So truth be told, I've never been a realtor, John. Really? I've attended national real estate conferences. I know some of the top realtors in the country. I've shared the stage with several of them. And obviously, as a successful loan originator for the past almost two decades, mm-hmm. I had to learn a thing or two about real estate in order to be the best partner. So 
I like the fact that you and I are talking about this because it's not like I have an agenda or something to sell. Mm -hmm. It truly is like most episodes. Everything that I have experienced, the world according to me shared with you. Nice. You ready to go? I'm born ready. You were born ready. What? If I were to ask you, John Coleman, the consumer. Yeah. How much money do you think realtors make? Well, it depends. Some of them make no money, but I could see it being a lucrative career where they make six figures and up. Okay, so I'll answer that for you. Like anything with Pareto's principle, the 80-20 rules, we know it. 20% of realtors make 80% of all the money. And I'd take it one step further. I think it's good to know that 90% of the money is probably made by 10% oh. of, of, of real estate agents. And the reason behind it is not like you have to go to college to become a licensed real estate agent. You have to take a course. You have to pass the test. And the, the, the course is more on ethics and laws. And the test is ethics and laws. But it's little about how do I sell? How do I market? How do I take the right pictures? How do I upload those pictures into some kind of a multiple listing service? How do I write the description? How do I write a contract? How do I negotiate a contract? Right? That's very little of that. So because of that, you have a lot of people who get their license, one would say is a very small barrier of entry, but you have few that turn it into a full-time career, right? And the reason for that as well is it may take you three years. It may take three years of getting up every day, putting on your uniform, you're unemployed, you're broke, you're not getting a paycheck, yet you're going to put one foot in front of the other and be okay with not making money, but you're going to work eight or 10 hours that day. You're going to work on networking, you're going to work on expanding your, your brand or expanding your network, right? That's, that's what, a, what a realtor does. So if I asked you how much do they make, your answer, pretty accurate. Most make nothing or less than 20 grand a year, but those that are, are, are successful, 300, 600, a million, $2 million a year is not out of the picture. Hmm. Okay. But how they get paid, what I was looking for in terms of an answer, it's per transaction, an old school way of thinking would be a realtor is going to make 3% per side. Well, what does that mean? Well, you make 3% on the listing side. You make 3% on the buyer side. Why is that? Because someone found a listing and someone convinced the seller to pay a 6% commission of which the seller is going to give three half of it to the person who brings the buyer and half to the person who represents them as the seller. That's an old school way of thinking. In today's world, the way that we know it, especially with price points being where they are, inventory being low, most realtors are earning about 5% divided by two, so two and a half per side. And we, again, we say per side because the seller typically is paying the commission, although there's a crazy, wacky, wacky new, new lawsuit out there where it has a little bit of traction if it gains any teeth. It could change the world as we know it. We're not going to go there. It's not for, for this episode. Just sidebar, know that there is a lawsuit out there where if the plaintiff won with the plaintiff won, the end, one of the end results would be sellers quit paying real estate commission and buyers would have to pay real estate commission to, to have a realtor find them a home mm -hmm. and sellers would be on their own to figure out whether or not they wanted to, to pay a real estate commission to a realtor to sell their home. Again, we're not going there. I, di I, I digress. Let's get back to old school way of thinking was a seller went to list their home for sale. They paid a realtor 6% commission on average. And of that 6%, the selling agent or listing agent kept three. Then they enticed buyer's agents to bring buyers to the home by sharing in that commission and giving up half. By the way, the same realtor who represents a seller can also represent a buyer. Wouldn't that be ideal? Cause you get, you keep it all in house. Well, you're thinking same transaction. Mm. I clarified because I have a lot of people who are like, wait a minute. So I have to choose if I'm in real estate, whether I want to represent sellers or buyers. I'm like, no, 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 no. You can represent seller on this transaction and a buyer on a separate transaction. For example, your seller is selling their home and they want to buy another house. You can represent them to sell their home. Then you can represent them to buy another house or your sellers are selling the home and they're moving to Portugal. You're never going to talk to them again. You could represent them to sell their home. And then you could ask them, who do they know that's looking to buy or sell real estate? They refer you to their cousin's uncle's brother. And then you help that person go buy a house. Now you're representing the buyer. It's not a, Oh, if I represent sellers, I represent sellers. If I do buyers, I do buyers. And to your point, yes, you can become what's called a transactional 
agent, which that means I've listed the home. Someone, maybe I hosted an open house, they came in and they wanna buy it, at which point I'm representing both sides. And a lot of times a realtor would do that at a reduced commission. Hey, John, I know I listed, I know I represented you at a 6% commission, but if I represent both sides, I'll only take five. Okay, they're still crushing it. But here's what I want everyone to understand. Whether it's I'm getting 3%, 2.5%, 2%, because commissions are negotiated. People should know that. Every consumer has the right to negotiate their commission with their agent. That is something that can be done. If I'm listing my house, I don't have to list it for 6%. I may choose to list it for seven because that realtor is worth it. I may be willing to, I may want to only list it for four and a half because I feel like the home's going to sell itself and I just need some kind of representation. I would caution anybody in life, you get what you pay for, right? So that's on you to do your due diligence, do your research and have those conversations. And then to the agent who is receiving the commission, that's typically the listing agent, they then share a portion of it to other agents if they'll bring a buyer. Right? It's a way to bring buyers to your property and typically you split it in half. Not always. I've, I've, I've seen agents list homes for 5% where they kept three and only paid two. They kept three for themselves and only paid two to the buyer's agent. The reason why is the market was 2021. It was hot as all get out. There were five buyers for every one listing. Therefore, that listing agent understood that they had the power position that they didn't have to equally split their commission 50 50 they could they could keep a larger share mm -hmm. and so so just know that in general it's a sliding scale rule of thumb you would say six percent divided by two five percent divided by two four and a half percent divided by two four percent divided by two so let's just say on average realtors are making in the united states of america in 2023 two and a half percent on average what a four hundred thousand dollar home you may start drooling john I can do 10 that. grand. Oh, thank you. I did it for you. I know. <laughs> I did it for you. It's $10,000. That's a lot of money. That's a shit ton. That's a lot of money to, to for how many hours of work? What did you have to do? Like click like, a couple buttons. Click, 20 hours of work? Fill oh. up some balloons. Yeah, what? Okay. Y'all, listen. You're not paying $10,000 for those six or eight hours. You may be paying for the thousands of hours that they put into their craft to know the market, to know the neighborhood, to understand contracts, to have the right connections to the right lenders, the right insurance companies, the right home inspectors. They may have had the right relationship built with the agent who was listing it that your offer got preferential treatment just because the listing agent knew based on experience that your agent was darn good at their job and had a very high quality professionalism about them and therefore knew that when they have a buyer make an offer, it goes through. Mm -hmm. Their buyers don't walk, right? So please caution anyone who's not in real estate, who's listening, just understand that. Yes, it is a lot of money. Yeah, they made 10 grand. And yep, they may have showed five or 10 homes for a total of five or 10 hours and then spit, <coughs> excuse me, as I sneeze. And then they maybe spent a few hours managing the transaction to make 10 grand, but you didn't pay for that. You paid for everything that came before that and everything that's going to come after that. You also pay for this. You pay for the luxury that that professional only got paid if, if you bought a house. What if they showed you 10, 20, 30 homes? What if they spent 20 hours with you driving know. you around town, hundred bucks in gas, maybe even bought you lunch along the way and you end up not buying. Guess how much money they earned? Nothing. Nothing. Yes. That's the price as a consumer you pay. I understand my realtor's gonna make a lot of money when I buy or when I sell, but there is no guarantee. So therefore I'm willing to pay more if it comes on a contingency basis. If not, you could have just paid them for their time. Hey, they're worth 50 bucks an hour. They're worth a hundred bucks an hour. So give me a thousand dollars. You get 10 hours of my time. At which point, I don't care if you buy. I don't care if you sell. I don't care if you get a great deal. All I care is that you want to keep on coming back to me, paying me a hundred bucks an hour. Well, you as a consumer don't want to do that. You want to pay only if you purchase or sell. And then as a buyer, know this, as a buyer, you're not paying a realtor commission 99 times out of a hundred. 99 times out of a hundred, 
the seller is going to be paying the realtor's commission. So it's never, I've never understood why a home buyer is like, well, I don't want a realtor. They cost money. No, nah, not really. Not really. And you want to be represented. You want somebody to have your back and you want somebody to take some of that off of your plate because your job is whatever you do for a living. Your job is not buying real estate for a living. Now you may pay a transaction fee and this is something good to know about transaction fees. Typically they don't go to your realtor. They go to their brokerage. They go to their brokerage. So if you're a home buyer, you may have to pay $295, $495, $695 as a transaction fee at closing. That's negotiable. I'll share that with you. That is neg negotiable. If you don't want to pay it, have that hard conversation with your real estate agent. But let's get back to the ten grand, John. Okay. The ten thousand dollars, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, is not is not all going to your realtor. Who does it go to? It gets split up, divided. Well, there's someone called a real estate broker, the owner of that franchise, the person who has the broker license, because they may be a licensed real estate agent, but or a licensed realtor, but they're not actually a broker. You have to have a broker and have your license hung underneath the broker. Well, brokerages are going to take a percentage. Like if I worked at Keller Williams, they may take 30%. If I worked at Coldwell Banker, they may take 35%. If I worked at Remax, they may take 5% goes to the house. So although I brought in 10 grand, I may only see six, seven or nine grand of the 10 because the house where I hang my license, they are getting a piece of it. And it's like anything in life, you get what you pay for. I could go somewhere where it's hundred percent commission and I just pay a transaction fee to the, to the house, to the brokerage. And if I do that and I'm a licensed real estate agent, I should know that I'm probably not going to get much in terms of training, support, <laughs> et cetera, from that brokerage, right? I get what I pay for. I'm only paying a transaction fee for every home I sell. Yeah. I shouldn't expect my broker to do a whole lot for me. Five questions, I'm on my own. If I want some good marketing ideas, I'm on my own. If I want some coaching, I'm on my own, mm. right? Now, if I go to a brokerage where it's a 60-40 split, i.e. Caldwell Banker, what am I getting for this? Well, Caldwell Banker may be like, oh, well, if you work out of our brokerage, we're going to give you these, these relocation leads. We have one of the best corners in the market mm -hmm. and we get this many ups or pop buys or walk-ins and you can sign up and be a part of the schedule where every other Saturday from nine to noon, you can be on the floor. Oh, so I, I, I take less of a commission, but I get all this support. Yeah. You get leads, you get training. Okay. Mm -hmm. I may choose to do that at Keller Williams. They have this thing called capping. So like, this is how today's episode really came about. I was coaching a group of loan officers and I started talking to them the way that they should be talking with the realtors. And I said a term that they didn't know. I was like, yeah, you know, you need, I told them you need to help brokers of Kelly Williams fr franchises create more cappers. I'm like what is a capper? Oh, well in the KW model, their agents pay, let's just say they're on a 70, 30 split until they've paid in X amount of dollars in commission. And it may be 18,000, it could be 28,000. I don't know the exact number. Like I said, I'm not a licensed real estate agent, never have been, never really plan to be. But I do understand that the KW model, one of the benefits is once I've paid in a certain dollar amount, they're not gonna take any more money from me. That's called a capper. So if I'm a mortgage loan originator and I wanna bring immense value to an owner or a team leader at a Keller Williams office, I need to understand their commission structure. I need to understand what it means to be a capper. Because if that broker wants me to bring value, the best value I can bring to them is helping someone who sells eight homes sell 12. Someone who sells 12 to sell 16, right? That person who sells 24 to sell 36 because I'm helping that person become a capper. That's a, a ma massive value to the owner of a Keller Williams office or the team leader. As a loan officer, I have to know that. I have to know this type of terminology, right? I need to understand that realtors are paid on the buy side and paid on the, on the sell side. I need to understand that the commission typically comes from the seller and gets split between selling agent and buying agent. I need to know that when that commission comes in, there's a gross number, and then there's the net number. Because the gross number is how much was paid, but then the realtor's brokerage is gonna take a, a cut of that. Mm -hmm. And that cut's negotiable, and that cut varies depending on is it Century 21, is it Homes and Land, is it EXP, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Right, these are all things I should just know 
And then I should understand this. These people are 1099 for the most part. I'm sure there's a brokerage, maybe Redfin where they're W-2 and salaried. But, but the bulk of real estate professionals in the United States of America are 1099. They're independent contractors. As an independent contractor, here's what I can tell you. You don't have benefits offered to you. There's no 401k, 401k match health benefits. And when it comes to your taxes, your income taxes, well, when you work for an employer, like I employ people at Waterstone Mortgage, I understand when I do my financials that their payroll has what they made less their expenses. Their expenses could, could be like dent, dental, vision, mm -hmm. medical. By the way, I have an expense for all of that too as their employer. Then they have their payroll taxes, right? Both um, FICA and Social Security. Well, that FICA is double when you're 1099. Because when you work for someone else, your employer covers a portion, you cover a portion. When you don't, then you cover both your portion and your employer's portion. So I think it's good for everyone to know that when you're talking to a real estate agent, you're trying to be their partner, you're talking to someone who's an independent contractor, who's 1099. Or when you're a home buyer and you're choosing a realtor, please know you're choosing an independent contractor. You're choosing someone who's self-employed, they work for themselves. And they only get paid when you actually buy and sell something. They don't get paid to drive you around. They don't get paid to, to run numbers. They don't get paid to set you up on searches. They don't get paid to connect you with painters and landscape people and title companies and mm -hmm. lenders. That's no, part of their job, but they only get paid when something actually closes. And when, they, when something does get closed, yes, they do get paid handsomely, but they should because they're getting paid not just for the hours they put on your transaction, but for all of the hours that went into getting them to the point to where you chose them because you felt like they were competent, you felt like they were good at their job, and then for them to perform for you. Well, I feel like people, this is just guessing out there, but let's say I was just on the internet and I found my house and I had the money, like why should I pay a realtor? Because I did all the legwork, I found my house and then they're just there and they get a cut, they get a cut of it when I just did all the work. Yeah, and I would say, why were you doing all the work, John? Because you're, as the buyer, you're talking about the buyer, mm -hmm. you're, not, you're not paying the realtor. Right, that home that you found was already listed. It wasn't like you found it on your own. You didn't go door knocking, did you? You start walking neighborhoods, knock, knock, knock. I want to buy your house. Knock, knock, knock. No, you found it because it was on a website. Well, if it was on the website, that means a seller has already contacted a realtor. That realtor has already told the seller, hey, John, I'll sell your home for a 6% commission. Then they throw it up on the internet, mm -hmm. whether it's through MLS or an MLS type organization that then talks or APIs with Zillow and Realtor.com and all these other websites, you found it, you reached out to who? A realtor, right? When you called, you didn't call the seller directly. You, re you re reached out to a realtor who's going to get paid. The problem is you did so without being represented because that realtor represents the seller. So I'll tell you up front, besides talking to your lender and making sure that, that your lender says that you can qualify and that this is a good financial decision for you, your next call needs to be to a realtor who advocates for you because that seller's paying a commission regardless. So whether they pay it to their realtor who gets all the money or half to their realtor and half to your realtor and your realtor advocate on your behalf, it has always baffled my mind, pure ignorance, why a home buyer wouldn't want to be represented. I get it as a home seller. If you don't want to be represented and you think you can self-represent, eh, knock yourself out. I'm sure a good realtor, like there's this lady, Jenny Weimert in Orlando Market, who's like a who's who. Jenny and I have been friends for almost 20 years now. Jenny Weimert could sit down and be like, yeah, you don't need to use my team. But please know if you don't, statistically, you're going to sell your house for about 5% less than what I'm going to sell it for. So I'm, I love the fact that you're saving 2.5% by not having to pay my fee, but you're losing out on 5%. So your net negative is 2.5%. Want a four hundred thousand dollar home? That's ten grand. So you can sell the house yourself, John, and you don't have to pay my commission, but you'll still end up ten grand less less in your pocket. Right. That's what a good realtor could do. I'm not saying every realtor, because I'm that would be assuming every realtor was good. But as a buyer, it has never made sense to me. What you don't want to pay their transaction fee? Look, I get it. Nor do I. Nor do I have that conversation with them. Have that conversation. That transaction fee more than likely doesn't, doesn't go to your realtor. 
that transaction fee is owed to the house and the house is the real estate brokerage. Mm -hmm. So if you're, if you don't pay it, then your realtor has to pay it. Now you may say, I don't care. I don't care. My realtor is making 10 grand. So if it's 10 grand minus $500 mm -hmm. because they had to pay the transaction fee, I'm fine with that. And that's your prerogative to negotiate with your real estate agent. So when you say like negotiate, when realtors negotiate, because I understand what a loan officer does. They're like crunching numbers. They're actually f structuring your loan. But on the realtor side, are they like pushing any type of paper? Are they structuring anything on their end? Or are they just like connecting the dots and saying, hey, let's sit at the table. You sign title. You do this. No, a good realtor, A, has to negotiate the contract. Right? A good realtor understands the gotchas in the contract. Things like you have X amount of days for a home inspection. You have X amount of days to have your financing in, in order. You have X amount of days to get your appraisal done and back. And if you don't, you could jeopardize your big fat deposit. Right? If, if you don't do this, if, you don't, if you're a seller and you don't disclose the right things, you open yourself up to, to legal jeopardy. Mm. Right? A buyer could, could sue you down the road because you didn't disclose a leak you had in the home eight years ago or something mm. like that. But... What they do is they reach out to the seller or the selling agent. They negotiate on your behalf. They go out and pull comparable sales. Like, do you know how to comp a house, John? Like, like true, I'm not even. Oh, <laughs> I mean, uh, internet. Yeah, Google, no, so yeah, no, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so if you want to find out what the home was worth that you were making an offer on, you're going to do everything that most ignorant people do. That, that, that are educated, yeah. educated ignorant people, yeah. right? They're going to go to the property appraiser's website. Well, the property appraiser says this home's worth three seventy-five. No, that's the tax assessed value. Tax assessed value typically will back out land value. So the land may be worth one twenty-five. The tax assessed value is three seventy-five. Just using that math, the homes are usually five hundred, if not more, because tax assessed doesn't take into certain improvements. So no, uh, wrong, right? Mm -hmm. So I went to Zillow. Okay, cool. So you're using an algorithm. I mean, has Zillow walked this property? Does Zillow know? about the barbed wire prison that's 100 feet away? Do they know about the three sexual uh, re registered sexual uh, offenders that are in the neighborhood, right? Do they know that it has purple shag carpeting and gold mini blinds? And that there's a perfect circle, like a crop circle of black dust imprinted on the ceiling because smokers had lived there and ran the ceiling fans without ever cleaning. Sounds like you've witnessed a house that's had that. Uh, these are all true stories of homes <laughs> I've seen. And Zillow doesn't know any of that, yeah. right? Zillow has no idea. Does Zillow know that the house next door, that when it sold, it was halfway burnt down? No, but Zillow takes into its algorithm, well, the home next door sold for 190. There's no way your home was worth 400. Well, of course my home's still worth 400. That home for 190 was, you couldn't habitate it. It was, yeah. it was inhabitable. So in inhabit in inhabitable yeah, inhabitable inhabitable yeah, sure. it's habitable yeah. it was it, yes right so like you can sure trust it but are you trusting chat gpt yet no <laughs> you're not you should be playing on chat gpt you should be toying around with it having some fun but no it's not like zillow's not going to do it a realtor a licensed real estate professional a realtor can actually pull comparable sales. They know the market. They know the area. And then once you're under contract, I mean, do you know a home inspector? Do you know home homeowner's insurance? Do you know a lender? Do you know a title company? Do you know who to call if the home inspector says, we think there could be a foundation issue? Let's get a foundation company out here. No, but a good realtor does. Right? And you're, they're only getting paid when your transaction actually closes. And 99 times out of 100, when you're the buyer, not out of your pocket, out of the seller's pocket. And the seller's only paying them if the home actually sells. Right? So um, I don't know where, where your question started, but that's where it ended. Yeah. It ended with me saying, again, I don't see where it makes sense. If you wanted to sell without a realtor, man, you do you, homie. <laughs> you do you. But um, what else you got for me? Uh, so what would you, what, if you could go back, would you be a realtor or a loan officer? Loan officer every day of the, of the week. Every single day of the week. I love math. I love personal finance. I love problem solving. Um, we've had Leslie Heimer on. Mm -hmm. she, she has done both at a very high level. Anyone who has done both will tell you lending is harder. Period. End of story. Do not argue it. Lending is harder. But lending's hours are better. Hmm. Lending's hours are Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, making yourself available nights and weekends available mm -hmm. real estate. No, you're working 
nights and weekends. You're available 24-7, 365, <laughs> but you're working nights and weekends. Right. So uh, for me, and I like lending scalability. I like the professionalism that comes with it. Not saying there's not professional real estate agents, because, mm -hmm. I mean, anyone who is successful is professional. Let's just mm -hmm. say that. Mm -hmm. Anyone who is successful is professional. I just, I liked the suit. I liked the tie. Right. I liked the calculator. I like talking about people about their income, mm -hmm. their assets, wealth generating strategies. I like getting into their budget. I like to get into retirement. Like, mm -hmm. so, so if I'm an LO and I want to get to know more about realtors and real estate, like, how do I do that? Should I take a real estate class? Should I like attend a seminar? Should yes, I yes, yes. I mentioned Keller Williams earlier. I think every mortgage loan originator should go through KW Bold. Bold is a course they offer. You should go through it. You should maybe even sponsor it and go through it. If you're a branch manager, put a couple of your younger, hungrier, more aggressive loan originators through KW Bold. Mm. Yes, I think you should be subscribing to Inman, I-N-M-A-N. I did it for a year. After a year, I was like, okay, I'm good. I don't subscribe anymore. Housing Wire. I talk about Housing Wire all the time. I have written for Housing Wire. I am a Housing Wire <laughs> Public, guest, Published author. Published author, right, yeah. right? Yes. I love my friends over at Housing Wire. Cannot wait to be able to do a podcast with Logan, um, who's chief economist over at Housing Wire. We're about to figure that one out. He has his own podcast. I really like it. Um, there's his audio only where ours is on YouTube. Mm -hmm. People tend to like to watch us uh, not and listen to us on Spotify and Apple. But um, Housing Wire speaks to both audiences. So like the top of their daily email are links to mortgage articles and the bottom it's real estate articles. Start reading those articles. Read Inman. Go to an Inman conference. Go to a Housing Wire conference. Right, like I like coaching groups like the core because the core coaches both realtors and it, it, it coaches um, lenders, mm. probably 70 percent lenders and 30 percent realtors. But it coaches the top of the top of the top realtors. So you go to those events, you talk to those people who are coaching and you just pick up nuggets along the way. But yes, you should as a mortgage loan originator, you should study the real estate business, read the books like read Michael Mayer's Seven Levels of Communication read a Gary Keller book, hear, like, under, like know who Brian Buffini is, because, you know, no, um, oh my gosh, not Tracy. I almost said Brian Tracy. Brian Tracy is like an author in the same space as like a Brian Buffini. Mm -hmm. um, Tom Ferry, like understand what Tom Ferry is out there teaching, right? These are all things. Go to a EXP conference. You may have to sponsor it, but go and listen because you can only become a great partner if you understand your other party, your counterpart. Mm -hmm. right? That goes in anything in life. That goes literally in anything in life. The whole walk, walk them out of someone else's shoes, like get out there, put on their shoes, walk their walk so that you can talk their talk and then you can start bringing value to them. Okay. I, this is a question that came up thinking in our coaching class. How, if I'm a loan officer, how do I avoid getting played by a realtor? Like just having them put me through the ringer, jump through a bunch of kind of hoops and end up don't using me. I think that, that kind of that came up. I think that comes up. Um, this is interesting. We cover questions like this on um, our town hall, mm -hmm. right? So if you're a premium member of the Loan Officer Podcast, it means you're on TLOP online, you're paying the 25 bucks a month. We have a monthly town hall, and we answer questions just like the one that you, uh, you asked there, John. And my first response is you, A, didn't uncover a pain point, which is why they played you. And B, you didn't ask them the right questions, right? So you typically uncover a pain point by asking the right questions. And then if you ask the right questions, you uncover a pain point, then you can solve for that pain point. And when you solve for that pain point, you bring value. The minute you bring value, it's now not a matter of if, it's when they will refer you, right? So like I like to ask questions to the real estate agent that I'm, sitting, I'm meeting with. I try to ask them questions like, hey, what does your current lender do well? I love to know what's one thing you wish your lender did better. What worries you? Ooh, ask that question. What worries you? And shut up and listen. They'll give you a funny look. You may have to like double down on your question. What I mean by that is when you look at your goals this year, what worries you in terms of like what'll keep you from, from achieving them? What worries you during a transaction? What worries you when you're driving a buyer around or what worries you when you list a home for sale get them explain to you what worries them and then find ways to solve for that 
Now all of a sudden you're a true partner. You're not just another vendor with your hand out who wants an order. Hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. So I, again, I'm going to go back to, I don't know what we're going to title this because it was kind of all encompassing, which I want every episode to be that, right? We are only going to be able to take the, the, the baton from Dave Ramsey when he wants to hand it off from Clark Howard when Snatch he wants it. to hand it off. Give that to me. Well, we, we may have to get to that <laughs> point, but you know, we, if our audience understands our content is not just specifically geared towards one small sect mm -hmm. of the American populace. No, this is like literally everything we talk about should resonate with 70% of the American populace because you either want to buy a house, you currently own a home, you sell homes for a living, or you finance homes for a living, right? That is 70% of the American populace. I hope those that tuned in, if you're a home buyer, you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't know all of those reasons mm -hmm. for using a realtor as well as how a realtor is actually compensated. If I'm a lender, I hope you got out of this, oh my gosh, I now have the motivation I need or I now have the- Wherewithal. To go out and learn what I need to learn to be the best partner. Mm -hmm. And if you are a realtor, I hope I did y'all justice. I hope you listen to this, you're like, damn, I'm so happy he said that. Because sometimes you need someone else sharing your story because it hits home harder, because I'm not you, mm -hmm. right? I get to go speak this week to two different groups, right? Trustmark and Bank of England, I get to speak to. I am so excited to do, to, to do this, like literally honored, humbled, the whole nine. You and I are driving up to Fort Walton Beach. This is dropping Friday. Friday. So we'll be in Fort Walton Beach. Mm -hmm. By the time you are listening to this, we're actually going to be leaving Fort Walton Beach because today's Monday. We're recording on a Monday. It's dropping on a Friday. John and I are leaving Orlando on Wednesday to get up to Fort Walton. We get to speak on Thursday, mm -hmm. drive home Friday. But what I'm excited about speaking, but when I come in there, I understand at the end of the day, I'm just the cool uncle. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to tell those mortgage professionals anything. But they that, haven't already heard from their manager have, standing in the back. And these guys, I've been saying this stuff for months. Why don't you listen to me? Oh, but I love the presentation from D.O. Thank you so much for bringing it. Correct. <laughs> yes. And I hope that, that someone who's in real estate listening to today's episode and they're like, yeah, high five, brother. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You did us justice. Mm -hmm. So, um, look, you and I are kind of running long on time. So let's find a way to conclude. I will tell people this. If you like what we're doing, please share us. Mm -hmm. Please subscribe. Please give us a five-star review. If you're only listening, do us a favor. Hop on YouTube and at a minimum subscribe. Mm -hmm. You may want to watch us, but if you don't want to watch us, just subscribe so we can get our numbers up. It makes me happy. Put a smile on my face. Uh, my name is Dustin Owen. If you're trying to follow me on LinkedIn, we are at The Lone Officer Podcast on every other platform that you can find. And we love to hear from you. So if you think we're doing something well, let us know so we do more of it. Yep. If we, if you think we can do something better, Keep it let yourself. us, <laughs> let us know so we can, so we can work on it. And mm -hmm. there's a certain show you want us to do. Episode topics, we're all ears. Dude, I had a listener. I haven't told you this yet. I had a listener reach out to me. She goes, "Can you do an episode on X, Y, and Z?" I didn't know what X, Y, or Z was, but I googled it. When I googled it, I was like, "Ah, I can't do it." but maybe Joey or Rob could do it. There you go. So our first guest ever, Rob Farragher. Rob Farragher. Bring Rob Farragher is going to come back. Shout out Rob. He's going to sit in the hot seat and uh, he's going to help us fulfill a listener request. The XYZs of it. There we go. But in the interim, his name is John Coleman. My name is Dustin Owen. That's all the time we have for you today, but we'll catch you on the next episode. Peace. Bye.